Hi, and welcome to A Drummer's Guide 2, the podcast all about the things that it takes to be a professional musician aside from actually playing your instrument. My name is Emily Dolan Davies. I am a drummer by trade, but basically I'm here to just make you feel less alone if you're on this mad journey in the music industry and making a career from music. It's a whole thing. Um, and yeah, trust me. It can be rough. It can be very rewarding, of course. But uh, yeah, there's the yin and the yang always going on. So today I want to talk about um, something that a few people have asked me actually over the years. And um, I feel like I've touched on before, but I just wanted to delve properly into this subject. And this is the idea of knowing when you're ready for a gig, like knowing, right, uh, do I feel ready to either go and even audition for this gig? Uh, do I feel ready to actually go into rehearsals? Do I feel ready to actually be on the road right now? Uh, do I feel ready to get into the studio and record an album right now or even an EP or a song? Um, now, if you can't be bothered <laughs> to listen to the whole of this episode, let me tell you this and please just know this. It's how the majority of people that I know feel, um, it's certainly how I feel, is that uh, you will never 100% feel ready for anything in this life, let alone for in music, basically. Um, and I mean, I would invite you <laughs> to reflect. Just think about anything that you go into that's new. Do you ever feel ready? I know I don't. I can feel as ready as I can, but I never truly 100% feel ready. I just don't. And I think that that's okay. And also, like, I think it's impossible. In the same way, you know, perfectionism is a whole thing. Um, it's it's actually impossible to be perfect. It is. So there's no point in, like, okay, strive to be the best you can. Absolutely. 100%. But Perfection does not exist. And in the same way, I don't think you can be 100% ready for any gig because anything can happen. And by anything, I mean anything. And you're never going to be, you're never going to know all the outcomes. Look, I'm a self-confessed control freak, <laughs> like definitely. But um, I'm coming to realise that as much as I love to try and control things, nah, it's just not it's not possible. It's not possible. And that's in music, that's in my career, uh, that's in life. And it's the same with feeling ready for something. I truly believe that you will not feel 100% ready for anything. And to a degree, maybe nor should you, because you want to be growing, you want to have that, like you want to be on the periphery of your ability so that you can like then grow. Because I mean, personally, my favorite thing ever is growth. <laughs> So I'll always err on the side of like, I want to feel like a gig is reachable, but it's stretching me. And, and there has to be an element of uncertainty with that. And there has to be an element of discomfort and comfort within that discomfort, if that makes any sense to you. But anyway, um, but uh, all I'm saying is it doesn't matter how much you sort of practice a gig or, or for an audition or whatever, you're never, I, I don't think, you're never, you're like, you'll never truly feel 100% ready. I'll tell you the point that I get to. I get to the point of like, <laughs> uh, surrendering to the situation where I've done as much prep as I can or feel is, is, uh, is necessary. And then I will literally relinquish and just be like, all right, at this point, what will be will be. And I recognize now the point, and I wasn't always like this. I recognize the points now where resting is going to be the most beneficial thing for me moving forward for being ready for the actual situation, if that makes sense. So rather than what it's like when you're a kid and well, I don't know about you, <laughs> when you're a kid and you have a test coming up and you're cramming the night before, like, uh, you know, cram until whatever time in the morning and not getting sleep, not great for the next day when you've got to be up and, and actually comprehending the questions and then drawing on the information that you learnt like six hours ago. Not great, absolutely not great. And you know, these things, they remain. It doesn't matter what the situation. So anyway, that's kind of the overview of this. But what I will say is that although you won't feel 100% ready, 
and I don't think you should and I don't think you will um like accepting that first of all um and obviously it's very easy for me to say just accept it it's fine like I I know you'll have your own way of dealing with that and processing that and going through that and that's fine like you will have your way of doing that however what I will say is that obviously you do want to be prepared to a degree like you don't want to just rock up somewhere having not listened to any of the music having not actually practiced having not done it like any sort of um groundwork as it were so yes here's my uh the way that i personally um prepare things i will cite certain uh gigs as well because there's certain like every gig I do I approach slightly differently I think um, and I'm very aware of my own uh, shortcomings some of my shortcomings I have many and I'm sure that I'm not aware of many of them but the ones that I am aware of I try to kind of um uh let them inform me how i'm gonna approach a gig so the first thing that i will do is i will um obviously after actually listening to whatever material practicing doing all that like that's kind of that's a given though um i will then uh so let's say i've learned the songs like from the album say or the albums um and then i will research past performances so if or, or the gig rather as a, as a whole so if um if it's a gig that has been out and about before i will go and i will look up the live performances i will see how the album versions will translate to the live gig see if the structures are the same um see if the parts are similar see what the vibe is you know what i mean and just kind of like work it out now what i will say there's a caveat with this because um so I'm thinking about, for instance, let's say uh, when I did Tricky, for instance, uh, researching that gig and watching online videos, of which there weren't that many at the time, was really useful just to get an idea of how the gig r ran because it was such an unusual gig in the way that it did run um, because no song, there was no song that was set. He, and I've talked about this uh, before, but basically he would run his shows or he runs his shows like a, like he was a DJ almost. And he was bringing in different instruments at different times. He would signal when we would go to different sections. So what that meant was, who knows what we would be playing, like even down to, we wouldn't know what song we were playing until the MD would start, just hit the first chord or whatever on the keys. And then you have to know within like, a bar what song we're playing um so anyway so it was useful for me to kind of like just look up the the vast the variety of how performances and particular songs were played um but then on the flip side something like uh the voice so the voice kids in terms of researching that before i got into the rehearsal room i was very aware that I was feeling very insecure about even getting on that gig just because of the people that were in the room, um, like the other musicians in the room. I just respected them so much. <laughs> I still do. I don't know why I've said that in the past tense, like I don't know. Um, but that you know, they're world class. And to me, there were people that I, w I had wanted to play with for years. And I was, um, yeah, I was just feeling really insecure. So I needed to get secure in me just coming as I am and not trying to imitate someone else, if that makes sense. And when, uh, and obviously, well, maybe not obviously. So before me, uh, it was Ash Sohn on the gig. So huge, huge shoes to fill. And, um, you know, if I was going back and watching what he was doing, I knew that I would be letting... I would let that inform my approach and how I came to the gig and I knew in myself that I would start doing a poor impression of Ash, if that makes sense. Um, if I researched too much into the live thing. Um, also, I was very aware on that gig that I was feeling very overwhelmed and I would be v feeling very overwhelmed just by how the gig ran, the volume of songs that we were doing, just the way the way that it ran. So I didn't actually even watch the show until I had done the first lot of rehearsals because I couldn't bring the actual filming element, the studio element, how the show actually ran as a show. I couldn't even bring that into my consciousness yet because it was enough uh, overwhelm just from learning how to 
how to play the gig because it's a very unique gig as well. I'm quite good at picking out quite unique gigs, I feel, in terms of how they run. It makes me happy. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, so anyway, that is kind of how I initially approach gigs. And obviously, if it's a brand new gig, and um, like for instance, when I started working with Becky Hill, all she, sorry, I shouldn't say all she'd done. So at that point, she had just come off of the, was it The Voice? I feel like it was The Voice. Yeah, let's go with that. Um, so she hadn't done any live uh, performances aside from in that context. So it was very much a blank slate. So that kind of is, that kind of negates that research side of things, I suppose. But obviously research their songs, make sure you know them inside out, absolutely fine. Um, the second thing that I do is, and this, again, this was something that I learnt from, well, I've learnt over time, but the best, how can I how can I explain this when I would get on a gig from when I was a kid um, and by kid I mean in my 20s uh, I would be so um, insecure I suppose uh, and and so aware that I felt in myself that I was so um, green and I didn't have a lot of experience that's how I felt in myself and again not feeling ready to be there, not feeling worthy to be there, like going, oh my God, they've made a mistake. They, they, you know, what are they doing? Do they not know? Like, oh, are they gonna find me out? That sort of thing. And what that would mean for me is that I would not actually ask about the gig um, and find out what exactly it entailed. And instead, I, I would, again, going back to this research thing, I would absolutely drive myself nuts trying to work out what the gig entailed by like discerning certain things from emails or from phone conversations or from you know meeting up with the MD or whatever and just try and work it out myself rather than actually just asking what a concept anyway the first time that I actually actually actively did this um, and I was so proud of myself at the time and I still sit here so proud of myself was on, on the voice because at that point, by that point, and this was, tw when was this? I want to say 2019. Yeah, June 2019, maybe. Maybe. Um, and I just remember at that stage really understanding what I needed to know to do a good job. And at this stage, I was terrified. I was terrified me not with that musical director. Oh my Lord. And we were friends. So I was like, you know, I, I knew you to a degree and I was terrified. So I, um, but the thing is the fear, that fear of just like, oh my gosh. And, and, but then wanting to do the best job I could. I was like, do you know what? I'm just gonna have to ask. I'm gonna have to like, this thing that I've built up in my head in terms of I should know everything that I'm doing at all times. I should, you know, I should be perfect. Again, perfectionist tendency, absolute nightmare. Um, like all these things that I felt how I should present to this musical director. Um, it all sort of flew out the window as we were having this conversation. Uh, partly because obviously, oh, my neck. Um, I've uh, spoken about this before, partly because of the reading thing and the fact that my reading was not where it needed to be. So I knew that and I knew that I needed to divulge that up front. To which he was like, that's totally fine. Like, it's cool, you'll get it done. I know you will because that's who you are and I'm like, yeah, I don't remember if he actually said that in that way or whether that's what I heard, if you know what I mean. Um, but anyway, but then I was like, do you know what? This is like right now, admitting that I'm not where I need to be right now and it being met with, that's fine. You'll do it because there's other people that have gotten on this gig that also couldn't read and, you know, they're at a point now, so it's great. And having that level of vulnerability with someone about like in a professional context, I'd never had that. I'd never had that up until that point. Um, thank goodness I did. But what happened was literally in that moment, I was like, ah, well, this has kind of opened up the floodgates. So I can just ask now what, what else? So I literally was like, right, Dave, I need you to tell me because what I need from you, I need to understand how the gig actually runs in the room so that I can visualize that and I can get my ducks in a row in what I need to know and how I need to 
like approach this and he was like absolutely so i asked him the specific mechanics of how we go from going right we're going to do this song to then rehearsing it and then it being ready for the kid to come in to sing and then we take it to the stage i literally asked him about every little stage of that but like really specific kind of intricacies so that i and again this is me i like if i can visualize something if i can see it in my mind's eye i know that i can do the job i just need to know rather than guessing i was just like right okay so let's say we're doing a song right we're doing this song I said, I know that there's going to be charts involved. When do I get that chart? And he was like, right, you'll probably get it maybe a couple of days before. All right, cool. Um, but, and, and then he said, okay, and then what will happen is we will listen to the edit that I've done and we can all read along and then we play, <laughs> basically. And I was like, all right, cool. So in my head, I went, right, so if I get these charts two days before, but let's say that I don't. Okay, well, then let's just work as if that time that the chart goes in front of me and we listen, that's the first time I'm seeing the chart. Okay, well, now I know that's what I want to work towards because that way anything else is a bonus. So if I get it two days before, I'm laughing. I'm like, cool, I don't need to worry. So that was my point with that. And then he was like, right, and then we'll work it in the room together. And we've got a guy, lovely Steve Parry, who will then um, do any changes and like it's all on the cloud, the charts. And then he'll send the, the edited charts. And then, you know, that's how we, we work it. That's how we work the song. Um, and then we'll record it. And then that's it. We move on to the next. So, and I said, okay, so how many times are we playing a song each? She's like, meh, might be once, might be three times, probably maximum three times. And that is true, uh, unless we're working it, obviously. If we're really like getting, like reworking a song, it takes a lot longer. But if we're not, if we're doing just an edited version of the original, then okay, one to three times, and then we move on. And then you won't play that song again until the kid comes in two days later. Uh, we will play it three times, I think it was, with them. Um, and then you won't play it again until we're actually on the gig in the studio two weeks later. And I'm like, brilliant. Thank you. This gives me an image of what to expect, how I can work it, what I need to do, how I can, because the thing is, a volume of songs, we're doing like, I think it was like 40 songs or something like that for the blinds. Um, maybe more, actually. I can't remember. I think it might be more. I think I've underestimated that. But what it meant was, for me, it was like, right, we play a song, because for me, my brain only has so much capacity. I don't know whether you've noticed, probably when I'm trying to grasp at words, but my br I know that my brain has a certain capacity where um, I can retain songs. However, once, for instance, if I'm in a recording situation, once I've recorded that song, it literally falls out of my head. Someone was asking me about a song from... Um, the Darkness album, uh, Last of Our Kind. In fact, it was Last of Our Kind, the song. Can I remember how that song goes? No, like not even slightly. I can remember like Mudslide. I can remember um, Barbarian, obviously, because it was a single. I can remember Roaring Waters. Maybe Mighty Wings, just the beginning, but honestly, like, I just, my brain does not retain things that it needs to because I just have to retain so much. So what I knew from that information that I got from Dave was that, okay, so after we've initially played this song in the rehearsal room, we don't play it again for two days, and it's going to be on a chart. And by that point, I'm going to be able to read. So by the time I see it, and I'm a very visual person, I will have all the cues that I need to remember. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Um, and then I'm not going to look at it for two weeks. And then we're just going to play it when we're recording it. Um, to be fair, there was a, a rehearsal day in the studio uh, two days before as well. So or one day before, depending on the what part of the series we were on. But anyway. Um, so what that meant was I knew that I was safe because it was written down because lovely Steve Parry had had has our backs. Um, I knew that I could let that then fall out of my head and I didn't need to remember anything. And there was great freedom in that. And actually it made for such a wonderful way to work because there's something about for me retaining information in songs and stuff like that that brings with it a bit of tension 
um, she says with a bit of a weird crick in her neck. Um, and yeah, to kind of eliminate that, it just made it very fluid. And let me tell you, it made me the biggest fan of reading consequently, because I was like, this is the best thing ever. So uh, yeah, anyway, so that was such a good lesson for me in not being scared to literally just ask how the gig runs. And um, another part of that was and again, so let's talk about that as well with the voice. And I have touched on this before. Um, Dave would actually offer up information to me without me asking. He kind of, he kind of answered questions that I probably didn't know I should have asked, which were things like, he said to me, you're probably wondering why I've called you. Because obviously in the UK, there are hundreds of amazing drummers. Um, of which you are one. He did say that. And I was like, oh, that made me feel awkward. I was like, oh, I don't think so, but okay. Um, but he said, you're probably wondering why I've called you. And I was like, actually, now you mention it, yes. And again, this would be a taboo thing for me to ask. Like, imagine if, you know, I, I don't know, there was just fear around that of if I sort of address the elephant in the room, of like, why are you calling me? They might go, oh God, you don't have any uh, like confidence in yourself. Maybe you're not the right person for this gig. But anyway, he answered the question that I didn't ask. And he said, look, you know, I already know you can do the job. I know that you can play. We've played together. And at this point, we'd literally, I think we'd played together once in a jam night. I mean, I don't know how that, and that was maybe eight years prior. I mean, honestly, it, it cracks me up when I think about it, like the amount of trust that he put into me from off the back of one jam night, maybe it was two, I can't remember, but it was a long time beforehand. And he was like, look, I know you can play, just like there's many people that can play, but it's the energy that you bring and your positive kind of outlook and you're very like your energy is great um and i've seen you doing your talking to camera videos and just i think that that would really work with the kids and the other thing is you know it's very difficult being in these sort of long shoot days there like 10 12 hours and morale it's hard to keep morale up so i think that you would really bring a great element to the room just your general positivity and all that sort of stuff and i was like huh okay i get it and i'm being called for the person that i am and i found that really interesting and it's something that I'm trying to get better at in terms of just asking people like, why have you called me? Just so that I know that I can bring what their expectation is, if that makes sense. And just to check that they've got it right. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, I think it's worth asking like, why me? Why have you called me? Uh, and like, what are your expectations of me? How does the gig run? Because this is the other thing. It's very um, important to know if you need to have peripheral skills uh, that maybe they may feel are a given things like okay reading obviously very obvious one um backing vocals that's one that i've been caught out on before because i don't do backing vocals i try but no you don't want it trust me um or maybe they want you to do playback it's very important that you have those skills if they want that um or maybe they want electronics if you're if you're a drummer um and, and and just kind of understanding what the gig entails what is expected of you it's very important and then there's also the side of things like performance like on if it's a live gig what is the vibe on stage and again you may have already done this uh in your preliminary research like researching past gigs online or whatever but if there if this is a new gig ask what is the vibe going to be on stage is it going to be an energetic gig and you should be able to probably like actually gain this from the uh from the music but maybe not so you know do you want it to be energy filled do you want it to be moody and a bit shoegazy do you want it to, like how do you want it to roll do you want me to sort of be part of the background or perform you know what i mean like is it all about the artist or is it about the vibe on stage do you want there to be lots of interaction like just ask the question like what are you going for what do you want especially if it's an artist because to have a musician sat in front of an artist going look tell me what your vision is and i want to facilitate that for you in every aspect that I can how could an artist not love that someone that is invested in what the show is what they're trying to create their vision if you're the right there going I want to give you the best version of me to facilitate this ah 
you're golden you're absolutely golden so then essentially at that point once you've kind of done a bit of research obviously learn the songs I just spat that's nice um learn the songs and then ask what is expected any peripheral skills what the vibe is all that sort of stuff then it's time to actually do the hard work <laughs> so that's kind of the fun bit well not the fun bit actually I like the work bit and the research bit like I like the playing bit so um in terms of what I do to get the most ready I can I will always as you know my favorite if you are new here I do this thing uh I do this thing like I'm the only person I do this thing that many people do um all professionals do and that is I record myself I listen back I review it and then I uh repeat it basically so um I call it RRR <laughs> record review repeat uh, and that is the absolute basis that is the baseline thing that I do to make sure that I'm playing in the way that I think I'm playing in the way that I'm locking in with the tracks that I'm playing the parts that the you know the execution is correct so that I will do audi audibly first and then I will film myself and make sure that there is an element of performance there uh, that is translating, that I don't look bored. Uh, if I do, then I make the movements bigger. If the gig entails that, I will make sure that my playing is not compromised. Obviously, it's a given, but it's worth saying. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. That's kind of the number one thing. Because at the end of the day, I'm there as a drummer. I need to be able to play the drums. That's, you know, it sounds so obvious, but there we are. Um, then I, oh, this is another question good to ask, actually. Uh, sorry, when you're in the research phase, silly things like stage outfits what do you want me wearing on stage because sometimes you need to practice in stage gear for me that might be heels for instance or if um they want me in a particular outfit that has sort of like long arms things like that that may feel a bit constrictive i'm gonna need to rehearse in the gubbins because i need to get used to that so again that's that's kind of uh yeah that's part of it so that's when I will also rehearse in the, the, the garns, as it were. Um, and then the next thing I'll do is making sure that I have all the peripheral skills down. So again, like I say, electronics, any sort of playback situations, uh, any reading um, skills, just make sure that they're down. In terms of things like electronics, I will go into the module, whichever module I'm using, which I will choose based on what I need it to do, which I've spoken about in past episodes. Like it's all about like it executing the job that I needed to do and then I will delve in and I will look at the likely things that could go wrong on a gig and just kind of familiarize myself with the menus how to rectify things because you know we might be in rehearsals and someone might want a level up or down on the electronics I want to be able to do that in a matter of like 10 seconds so that I'm not you know wasting time I'm not keeping people waiting we can carry on progressing because there's nothing worse when you're in a state of flow with like getting stuff done and then suddenly it's stopped in its tracks because someone it, you're waiting on someone to do their thing um you know it's just the worst I hate it. plus I hate I just hate making making people wait it's it's ah it makes me very uncomfortable I should probably get used to it but anyway so yeah just kind of knowing your module or whatever or knowing the playback rig to know that when things change and they will change it's the other thing things will change things will always change don't think that they're solid they're not they're always going to be fluid so just give yourself enough kind of tools to make it work that's my key just make it work um and then the third thing that I will get uh, done and and sorted um, when going on a gig and this is more tour related than anything else I'd say uh, well it was at least that were that is sorry the fitness side of things I will make sure that I'm as fit as I can be because again look it's so different going into a rehearsal room to uh, rehearse for a tour versus that first gig that you do I don't care what anyone says you can be in that rehearsal room for two weeks you can be rehearsing in a way that you feel like you are performing your biggest performance the most energy going Rah! but let me tell you nothing will prepare you more than doing that first gig and being like oh <laughs> that's the fitness level that i need so and your fitness will be fine like it will get there in the tour but you know you've got to be out there doing the thing before you start um yeah uh 
yeah you have to be out there doing the thing to really understand the fitness level that you need because you can't simulate it basically at least in my experience i mean i will say i haven't been on the road since i started boxing and i do i'm very intrigued to see how my fitness levels translate now that i'm doing uh such an explosive and um uh aerobic uh exercise twice a week but that brings me on to my next point so i think base level get yourself to some sort of level of fitness uh before you go on tour and i'd say also uh like work it into your day-to-day so that you can then carry that through to being on the road if you are going on the road because maintaining a level of fitness has kept me sane and from sickness and just something to focus on that is for myself every day i think it's very very it's been very it's been yeah incredibly important for me so um yeah i would say that uh however what i will also say is just generally day to day fitness is a great thing like i say i'm doing boxing twice a week at the moment i'm hoping to up it to three times a week actually once i move but uh yeah i i fitness is just great (laughs) fitness is great and if that can help you in feeling ready for a tour or anything else you know just having that healthy body healthy mind connection I mean, that can't be anything but a good thing, right? As long as you don't injure yourself, obvs. Um, so anyway, I think that those things will give you the best shot at feeling ready to go and do a gig or go and do a tour or whatever. I will repeat this because it is so important and so true. You will never, ever, 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 ever feel 100% ready for a gig. And nor should you, I don't think. So you know what? Just throw yourself into it. Um, let me tell you as well, the exhale that comes when you've done the gig and the release and the pride and the relaxation that comes when you've done the thing there is nothing like it i can remember and i'm getting goosebumps thinking about it all the times that i have gone into a situation and felt oh my god i'm not ready I'm not ready for this. I don't feel like I can do it. And it, you know, it's obviously there's a lot of me that does feel prepared, but there will always be an element of me that's like, oh my God, like imposter syndrome, I suppose. But then when you execute the job and you do it, and not only that, you do a good job and people ask you back or people are complimentary or, you know, you feel in yourself, yes, I did that. That feeling, nah, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And the only way you're going to get that is if you're going in something feeling like you're being stretched, you're on the edge of your capabilities and then you rise to the occasion. And it is the best, the best, five stars, would recommend, highly, highly recommend. Um, But anyway, I hope that this has helped you in some way. I hope that, uh, yeah, I don't even hope that you, you feel a little more ready for a gig. I just hope that you feel a little more comfortable with the discomfort, the fact that you are not going to feel ready, and that's okay. Um, like I say, this is more than anything to... I don't know, if you're feeling like that right now, I hope that this gives you some solace and settles you a bit, that this is normal. This is absolutely normal to feel like that. And it's part of the fun of it. It's part of the fun of life. Like how dull would it be going into the same thing all the time that you just know exactly what you're doing and you know, you just execute it. That gets boring, that gets monotonous. Um, yeah, just add a bit, it adds a bit of, um, I wanna say aliveness, <laughs> energy, life. It adds a bit of life to your life. So um, yeah, anyway, go do the thing. It's gonna be scary but it's going to be awesome. (laughs) But anyway, I shall leave it at that. Um, If this episode has helped you in any way, inspired you in any way, please do feel free to like, share and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to or watching. Um, If you are listening actually on a podcast, I would love, love, love um, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review. It really helps just getting the word out a little bit more to people so we can all feel a little bit more connected, which is quite an important thing to me. Um, Always has been actually, always has been. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, Also, if you'd like to support this podcast, you can do over on on Patreon. So go to patreon.com forward slash Emily Drums and check me out. If you want uh, to get in touch or follow any other content, I do loads of little uh, little videos about various things about being in the music industry. Go check me out over on Instagram 
I've changed my username, people. Finally, it's now at Hey Emily Drums. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm happy. It's so much better than the last one. So uh, come find me over there. Hey, Emily Drams. And um, let's chat. Let's chat. Let me know if there's any subjects that you'd like me to cover, anything like that. Uh, it's always an open conversation with me because I'm all about making sure that I'm actually talking about things that are relevant to people. What a concept. But anyway, I love you and leave you. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are, whatever you're up to. And I shall see you next time for another subject. All right. See you later. Bye. Oh, tell me,